Well, great to be sitting here 1-0. Uh, a lot of feel good. Uh, really a lot of feel good. Yeah, we want to cherish the feeling. Uh, what we're facing over the next couple weeks, uh, this might be a foreign feeling to us for a while. But uh, by the same token, we played 71 guys. Uh, a lot of, uh, I think a lot of things we've been talking about came to fruition on Saturday. A lot of young guys that maybe nobody's ever heard of that we've been talking about got a shot to go on the field. Uh, I think it was typified by Ryan Shields' interception return uh, down the left sideline. And he's a walk-on. Uh, he went home at 196 pounds, and somebody ate him, and he came back at 233. And it's just an example of the width and breadth of the youth of our program uh, all over the place. Uh, a lot of young guys got a chance to play and played extremely well. Um, Ty Flanagan showed that he's going to be a powerful inside runner. James Madison shows he's got a burst with the ball, if not some ball security issues. Um, you know, you just go on and on uh, across the board. Uh, obviously, uh, Mitch Guller showed he's got some football skills left in his body and uh, in, in, on defense in the back end. We played, uh, at one time, we were playing three freshman defensive backs along with the old veteran, uh, <laughs> uh, Jason Miller. And we were playing uh, Ed Kenneth Geary at safety and the two true freshmen, Caleb Brown and, and uh, Brandon Monroe at corner. And that, that's not just the future of our program. The future is now for a lot of those guys. And be awesome to see them play over the next two weeks as we get ourselves prepared to play Sac State here for homecoming in, uh, in three weeks. These two upcoming games, I know you don't like them, right? It's not something you like. Well, I, I tell you what, there, there's so many different plateaus or plans. Uh, I love them as an athletic administrator. I love them as a college president. I love them as a member of the ISU athletic department. Uh, but as the highest you head football coach, I wouldn't, if, if we were in the Pac-12, I wouldn't want to play in the NFL. I wouldn't want to play in the NFL team, and that's the same thing. You know, when, when you're going up to resources that are just unimaginable above you, and them saying, okay, well, they got 11 guys, you got 11 guys, compete. Well, yeah, okay, it's it's not quite the same. So by the same token, uh, our guys are 18 to 22 years old, or in some cases uh, our putter 28 or 40. No, <laughs> but we, our guys, you know, are optimistic. Uh, you know, young guys uh, in America are optimistic, and they're competitive, and they want to play a game. They realize it's just a sport, and anything can happen all the time, and it usually does. Uh, ask the Cougars at Washington State. So, uh, but also, you don't have to ask the Ducks at Oregon because I have a team that's picked at the very nether regions of the Big Sky Conference, hang 28 on the University of Oregon, got our attention. So anything's going to be possible for us, and everything's going to be possible for us on Saturday down at Folsom Field. Well, Mike, you know that firsthand. You've, you've gone into Colorado, and everybody knows what happened. And it, it was a 10-year-ago uh, opportunity for us, and we went in level, emotionally, pretty forward, uh, with a couple of great players that we knew about that maybe nobody else had heard of. Uh, Michael Jefferson, in particular, wide receiver who had transferred to us from the University of Arizona, was an outstanding player. Um, and we actually went in with our backup quarterback, who played outstanding in that ball game, and then he eventually went back to the bench, and the other quarterback started to finish the season for us here in a, in a very good season. But we were built defensively to play against a Pac-12 team, and it, you only you only get 60 minutes to have to play against them. And the, the one thing that was similar to that team that's similar to this team is we have good size on the interior part of our defensive line. Uh, John Raheem and Nico Taylor, uh, Trevin Alloy, you know, they're big enough to muscle up inside. And, and it'll be a good challenge for them to play against the University of Colorado's offensive line, which is a little young. Um, they only start four seniors on offense. And, uh, it'll be a good challenge, just a great challenge for us, and we'll see where we lie. This is not like going to the University of Washington in 2013. We're not the team that went to Nebraska in 2012. We're a lot better in a lot of areas, and hopefully it'll show up on the scoreboard on Saturday. Are you better than you were last year when you went to BSU and UNLV? Well, we're, I hope we're the team that went to BSU and played the first two quarters. Because from the third quarter on for the next six quarters, it was devastation, and we were a wasteland, and we ran into a ditch and couldn't get our way out of it. And it took some really good coaching by our staff to get us back to being at a competitive level, but it destroyed, literally wrecked our whole season because we lost a quotient of our confidence. And what you want to do in this game is you want to play confidently throughout the game as long as possible, regardless of the scoreboard. And that will bode well for how you're going to play the next one. And that will take you into homecoming against Sacramento State, which is really where the arrow on our whole season is pointed.
any bad memories from those games last year? Oh God, all? every single one of them. Uh, the worst was that I hurt my shoulder trying to push him out the door at Nevada, Las Vegas, 104 <laughs> degrees, nobody wanted to go, and we played like it. But actually, if you go back and examine, we played well at Boise State, and Boise State is chock full of NFL caliber guys and a very good nationally ranked football team. And we went to UNLV, and we played well early until we induced ourselves into our own catastrophe by getting a, PH, a field goal blocked. And from that point forward, it was just, it, it was desolation. And it took us a long time almost to, clearly till the Montana game, to develop some sort of a line about who we were. So it's been imperative since I saw these two games on the schedule back to back that from a management point of view as a head coach that we manage these games effectively enough to be competitive and good headed into Sacramento State. So all eyes, in my mind, are on our coaching staff and how we prepare and handle these next 11, 12 days. Is you, mentioned, like, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. you mentioned the, the two games back to back. How closely do you work with Jeff in scheduling your money games? No, Jeff handles it and he lets me know what the deal is. Because it's really above Jeff's pay grade too. Jeff schedules them, but we're under pressure from the top down to play these games. Because this supports not just athletic department, or not just football. It's just, it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a fabric of FCS football. North Dakota State plays them, uh, Montana plays them, everybody plays them. It's just, it's, uh, you know, it's just akin to a Pac-12 team playing an NFL team. The jump is so far from Big Sky to the Pac-12. It's akin to going from the Pac-12 to the NFL, which is a monstrous jump in and of itself. So uh, I look at it and I say, hey. That's what it is, and nobody's whining and crying about it. Nobody, hey, forced me to take a head coach job at an FCS level. It's just what you do. So let's go play. And you ask Virginia how it feels, or you ask Eastern, or you ask uh, Washington State how it feels. It doesn't feel good. And so if Colorado disrespects us, it takes us lightly. We'll beat them. Mike, is it more of a you? Had, you had talked about last year and the carryover effect on a team. Um, is it more of a mental situation with players? You talk 18, 22-year-old guys. Is it more mentally the next couple of weeks to keep them in a good situation with conference play starting? <laughs> or does that fall on the coaches to keep them in a good mental place? We just had the conversation with the Pac-12 TV network, and the coaching answer is, of course, that this is beneficial to your program. You used to speed a better players. you got to be, you know, you're, the game's going to slow down once you start playing that. That's a lot of coaching hyperbole and hogwash. The real thing is that we have got to make sure that our guys who want to compete and play at this game are given the best opportunity to be successful, play after play, series after series, and then it is what it is. It just is what it is. You got to shower it off and play Sac State. Colorado's offense, obviously they've only played one game, but they do seem to be clicking and their quarterback just got packed 12 accolades after week one. You know, how do you plan on Trying to There's that. a great side story to Colorado's quarterback in Safo. Uh, he was programmed to be the number two. Colorado had was depending on uh, the current quarterback at the University of California to graduate from Texas Tech and come to the University of Colorado. And then the last moment, he switched to the University of California, and Safo went back into being the starter. So I'm a fan of Safo. He's from Bellman Prep in Tacoma. Uh, he's battle tested. He's seen a lot. He's carried a lot of the anguish of the non-productivity of the Colorado program because he plays quarterback. So I'm really kind of a fan that's been batted around, bat, or a, a fan of a quarterback that's been batted around, batted around. I hope he has a great season. And I hope he plays as well as he can against us, and I hope we play well against him. Yeah, I believe against Simon Frazier, you weren't happy how the quarterback got loose a couple times. Their quarterback? Uh, yeah. Yes, I'm, so this guy, he <laughs> Our ran, quarterback. <laughs> no, not, you didn't like that either. Our you quarterback like got loose, and I didn't like either one. <laughs> yeah, you didn't no, like I, that. I, Go ahead. This guy, he rushed 14 times for 72 yards, um, so he, he likes to get out of the pocket and run a little bit, and you didn't like that against Simon Frazier, so how do you approach this? Their offense is a little more uh, predicated on the quarterback being able to run the ball. Called quarterback runs, run, quarterback run options, 6'4", 30, I mean, he's a good running back at quarterback. So a uh, little bit different type of strategy. Again, just across the board, from Tom Brady to uh, the smallest school's quarterback in high school, when that quarterback drops back to pass and he starts running, he's not playing quarterback and he's being poorly coached. When our quarterback runs in the out of the pocket, he's not being pressured. He's, he's not playing the position. 
the same thing happened last week against Simon Frazier. When their quarterback ran, for the most part, he was running because he wasn't playing the position, and he was under 50% completion percentage. And yeah, he extended plays, and yeah, they got first downs, but you don't fear a quarterback that runs when he's looking at the pass rush. And I wasn't fearing our quarterback last week in the early part of the game when he was looking at the pass rush, too. So for us, Safo is going to run the ball as part of the program, as part of the program play. Our quarterback is not going to run the ball, and when he runs the ball, he's not playing the position. And, and we're implementing that to his head and his brain because there was a couple plays on Saturday that Tanner was perfect. He kept his passing grip. He shuffled through the pocket. It looked like he was starting to run, but really he was just trying to extend the plate and dump the ball to Hagen Graves or Josh Cook, uh, which he did an excellent job of once he got into the flow of it in the second quarter. We want to see more continued improvement, uh, development by Tanner Gilbert, quarterback. I'm what is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Go sorry. Ahead. I'm assuming you've obviously gone over the film with Tanner and everything. Oh, uh -huh. What did he think when he was running? You can ask him. Today? I have no idea. I just know I said what we needed to say. <laughs> Mike, uh, we both, I know you watched, and I watched a little bit of the Colorado game with Colorado State. Defensively, they look very good to me, but what were your impressions? They're very good defensively because they're so experienced. And they have seven or eight guys defensively that have started for three years. They got a couple guys that are thirty game starters. I mean, they're an experienced, savvy defense. Again, that's battle tested and battle hard. And there's no substitute for experience at all levels of football. And when you go into a game with experienced guys, they know how to play. They're not. They, they might get surprised, but they don't get overwhelmed by something they're not prepared for. So Colorado. Uh, De especially on defense. Uh, so well coached by Jim Levitt, former head coach at South Florida, uh, who, who cut his teeth in his coaching career with Bill Snyder at Kansas State. They run man press on the outside. Uh, their corner play leads them. Uh, J Jim Levitt's corners have always been the leading part of their defense. Yeah, they're good in the front. Yeah, they're pretty active at linebacker. But their play at cornerback defines them. And Colorado will play against us with two very fine corners who play bump and run, and it'll be a severe challenge for our young receiving core on the outside. Did they do anything that surprised you defensively, Mike, mm -hmm. watching the game? No, we've been watching Colorado State or, or Colorado play uh, defense for a long time because I'm a fan of Jim Levitt. On offense, are they uh, a little faster, more up tempo than? Nobody's more up tempo than we are. We're still up tempo. We still go no huddle. Only when we get ahead, we actually got into a huddle last week. The <laughs> fullback in the game, Austin Campbell, got worn out a little bit playing fullback. But yeah, they they go tempo, but that's just everybody does now. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Last year, um, Hawaii went in there and beat them with Don Bailey. As you know, any uh, anything you can drop drop from that game being the no, there's no similar offenses. Hopefully, hopefully there's no carryover for us and no carryover uh, for them as we uh, as we go forward. Because we're not as similar offensively this year as we were. We've changed a little bit offensively this year, just by the nature of the fact that we are deeper at running back, mm -hmm. and we need to obviously put our running back core on the field en masse at times, as you saw uh, last week when uh, we got a chance to couple, turn a couple freshmen loose. Uh, Michael Dean, uh, one of those guys, you know, he's fast, he's hyper fast. He can't play every play, but he's hyper fast and fun to watch. So you try to run more being so deep and try to protect Tanner a little bit? I don't know. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Mike, in last week's game, <clears throat> who on your roster kind of elbowed their way to the front and earned some more playing time that maybe you weren't expecting. He just walked in the door, Jake Pettit, number 40. He let us see. He was second on the team in tackles at, at on kick teams. He played great. He played great at linebacker. He needs to play more as a scrimmage player. And he's playing behind um, Mario Jenkins, who's one of the great players in the in the nation. So there's playing time for Mario, and there's playing time for Jake, and there's playing time for Hayden, and there's playing time for Joe Martin, who had a spectacular interception and ran all around the place and led us in tackles. Uh, our whole linebacking core, Ryan Shields, uh, Luke Holloway, uh, Christian Holland, that whole linebacking core showed that they're going to be a, a force, and not just a force of scrimmage players, but they have added width and depth to our kick teams. So I'm mostly impressed, A, by our, our linebacking core, and then Mitch Gold is faster than I thought he'd be coming out of pro baseball. Mike, uh, I'm talking with Joe Martin for our halftime interview for this week. That interception for a linebacker, that was extremely athletic. Tell me about Joe, what he brings to the table for you, what he brings to your defense. Well, Joe played quarterback. He was a two-way player at Spanaway Lake High School. I'm a huge fan of recruits out of the South Puget Sound League in Washington, in the western Washington area, the Federal Way, Tacoma, 
area on the outline is suburb areas around there. It's just been great football for about 30 years. It continues to be outstanding football. It's the league that Kyle Williams came from. Uh, it's just an outstanding league. And Joe was one of the best players in that league, but he played quarterback because his team was outmanned at other positions. And really what he was, was going to be was going to be a college safety or a college linebacker. He's just become an excellent college uh, space linebacker, essentially almost a strong safety, playing outside. But he's also emotionally wired to play the game. Uh, I, I told the team, Roger Cooper should have to pay me, pay me to allow him to coach Joe Martin because no one loves to play football more than Joe Martin. Every day, he can't wait to get on the field. Practice field, game field, anything. He loves to play the sport of football. And as only a sophomore can, he's naive enough to think that every day is fun. You've had a week to go back and, and look at how your kicking game performed, both kicking the ball, returning the ball, and the coverage and return squads. How, how do you feel about that today? Well, the difference between sand and concrete. <laughs> We're formidable on kick team now. The soldier units played great. Our coverage guys were awesome. Anthony Ricks had the single outstanding play of the game when he downed the ball after a 63-yard punt down inside the one-yard line. The key play to play the ball game. Uh, Sean Cheney obviously showed he cannot kick off and punt at the same time. They're two different motions. Zach's got to come back and be the kickoff guy. Uh, but our soldier units, as led by Jake Pettit, uh, have, have really risen. We, we have now a – we are good paint. We are good paint. And you go to the store and you mix up some sort of azure blue Pacific mist paint, we've got good paint because we put good stuff in there and it's going to last a long time. Hey, and you return some punts? And we return some punts. <laughs> we had great kickoff return. We did an outstanding job in punt and coverage. And we did a pretty good job in uh, PAT field goal. We got a little bit of leaky drain taken care of. And uh, just overall, just much improved. Any message for the young offensive line going against a, a Pac-12 team this week? Uh, we, yeah, we gotta get. We just gotta get better. I mean, regardless of who we were playing, we gotta play much better than that. Our front didn't play well early. The interior part of our front didn't play well early. Tanner was running. Uh, we had middle press, middle uh, pressure in our pass protection. And that's got to be shored up because we're so young in the front. So, but Thomas Lazork is a is a senior in front. He played very very well. But our true freshman and our our soft Richard uh, sophomore right guard, those guys made mistakes at times, and we can't allow that kind of leakage. Mike, are your unavailables from last week still unavailable this week? For the most part. Okay. For the most part. Any Particularly in our offensive line, most part. I'm not asking for names. You're not getting better. names. I know, better. <laughs> I know better. Any update on when those offensive linemen might be back? Uh, yeah, but you know, I have to do the Tom Cruise thing, disavow any information I might have to tell you. So, no, I don't want to have any comment on it. You'll know what I know. I'm out. Thanks, Thanks you guys. Thanks. You guys have a great week. See you. Enjoy your